really an important concept that's going to propagate through the rest of this course. We're going to learn about confidence. That's really a topic that from statistics you may have encountered, or should have encountered, I hope, in your uh, prerequisites, but may not really have understood. Why the heck do we look at confidence at Today's class, we're going to dissect the confidence interval, and by the end, we should have a good understanding of exactly what that lower bound and the upper bound value from the confidence interval means. And more importantly, how to use it in the future. We're going to see this kind of like these squares. Confidence interval is somewhat related to the next section we're going to look at, which of course is monitoring and statistical control charts. And then they also show up very importantly in the experimental section. The last uh, month of this class in April and March, where we do experiments, we want to be able to judge whether various factors in our experiment have a statistically significant effect. So this whole concept of statistical significance hinges on confidence intervals. So let's take a look at that. The reason why I looked at the central limit theorem last, last time was because it, it naturally leads to confidence intervals. So let's recap the central limit theorem. We said that if we've got data from a distribution of unknown distribution, we don't really care really as long as that distribution is not adherent. And we take independent samples, we calculate the average x bar. And I hope to convey to you last class that computing at x bar has got some great properties. This really powerful statement here says that this x bar, this average we calculate, is going to come from a distribution which is normal. So while we may take data from a uniform distribution or an f distribution or some other distribution with a long tail, for example, a distribution of that nature, we're taking independent samples from this distribution. So I'm picking values independently from that distribution. I now have seven, eight, nine values from that distribution. I compute the average of that, of those nine values. And that average, for example, may be over here. And it says that that number, x bar, comes from the normal distribution, even though this underlying data is not normal. And it's going to have mean of mu and variance sigma squared over n. Where that mu and the sigma refer to the original distribution. It refers to this distribution's mu and this distribution's sigma. So this distribution has a mu over here, the orange distribution, and it has a variance sigma squared. Every distribution, no matter what this type, f, chi squared, uniform, there is always the mean, the population mean, and the population variance for that distribution. That's why there's this criteria here. Any distribution with finite variance. Okay, so that variance there refers to that variance down there. So population parameter, Greek letter. So it says that x bar is going to come from a normal distribution with that same mean and, that, and sigma squared. Okay. This is great. This is powerful because Let's say this orange distribution represents the samples of the viscosity that I take from my system. I would like to be able to say the average viscosity that comes from my process is such and such. I will never know the population viscosity mu. Okay? But if I take a certain number of samples, lowercase n, independent samples, <coughs> I can then estimate a new value x bar. Let's take this concept a little further now in this crazy into today's class. If I take another group of samples, a second group of large n samples, I'm going to calculate another x bar. So the first time I calculate an x bar, I'll call it x bar 1. The next time I take n independent samples, so my second set of independent samples, I'm going to get a second x bar. I'll compute a third x bar, a fourth x bar, a fifth x bar, and so on. Every time I count that x bar, I'm going to get a different number. Okay. That's why x bar comes from a distribution, a normal distribution. Every time I'm going to get a different x bar, that x bar is as if I had sampled it from a normal distribution. With that, with those parameters, sigma, 
squared over n for the variance and mu. So the blue values come from the normal distribution now. The sigma squared over n and mu. Okay, so two different distributions. The underlying distribution in orange, which I don't know, that's what's the box over there on the left. X bar, on the other hand, from a different distribution, the normal distribution, same mean, okay, and variance different. The difference is sigma squared over n over here, and the variance over here is sigma squared from the original distribution. So there's a conceptual example illustrated where my original distribution happened to be normal as well. That's a thin line. The x bar values come from the distribution with the thick of the darker black line. So my raw data over there, I take five samples from this thin line distribution, compute the x bar value, I'll get a point coming from the darker distribution. The more data we take, the more samples I take from this orange distribution, for example, the better and better my estimates of sigma are going to be. So the better and better my estimates of mu are going to be. This variance is going to pull in and then get a tighter and tighter estimate. It makes absolute intuitive sense. The more data I collect in average, the better my estimate of that average is going to be. Environment Canada, they measure the temperature in Hamilton. If they have two weather stations in Hamilton or they have ten weather stations in Hamilton, clearly the estimate using ten independent measurements of temperature, far more accurate estimate of the average temperature. Okay, so this makes intuitive sense to us that the variance has this n in the denominator. So more samples, reduced variance. Let's take this in and put in some numbers here. I said last class here was this example of polymers that we were measuring the viscosity from. And I've got nine independent samples given over here by the collector. The mean is 20 and the standard deviation. 3.81. That's my sample standard deviation. Let's assume for an abstract example here, I happen to know the population state. We're going to relax that assumption later on today. But if I do know that sigma, let's take a look what happens. The original data, x independently measured, I compute x bar. From the central limit theorem, we know that x bar comes from the normal distribution of the mean and mu, sigma squared over n. x bar is going to have, in this case, the value of 20 units, and the sigma there is 3.5. Awkward to work with. So we introduced in the last class the concept of standardization, where we shift and scale or center and scale. So I'm going to mean center and scale, and that's what I'm doing down here in the Take my x bar value and construct the z value for it. So standardization or normalizing data always follows this approach. You center around some mean, some average. And I divide through by some scale, scaling factor. So I've written mean here and standard deviation. Absolutely no requirement to use this, the mean and the standard deviation. I could substitute in the median and the MAD, the MAD. Okay, if I wanted a robust estimate of Z that's immune to outliers, I could simply replace the mean there by the median and the standard deviation replace that by the MAD. If I knew my raw data had outliers and I didn't have the time to go and screen every single data point to go check if it was an outlier or not. So no need to feel constrained that you have to use the mean and standard deviation. We do that though in general, but you can substitute it if you want to go last Z with other alternatives. Okay, so that's a bit of a side point. Let's come back to our, where we are. We construct a Z value for this X bar. So X bar is data that now comes from a normal distribution I subtract off the mean, I know the mean is going to be mu from the central limit theorem, and I know my standard deviation is going to be sigma over root n, because the central limit theorem tells me that's the standard deviation. So this z has a distribution now, that's the normal distribution, z comes from the normal distribution, and z 
as mean of zero and standard deviation of standard standard deviation of not a trick question. One. After standardization, the mean is zero, the variance is one. Okay. So if I to construct a plot of Z here on the board, there's Z, mean of zero sigma of this distribution. Standardization Z as mean of zero and standard deviation of one. Or variance of one. Same thing. Confidence interval follows the following idea. It says Z comes from this distribution. I would like to find a range where I can say with a certain level of confidence, a certain level of probability, that that range is going to contain the true mean. So, let's put some notation. Spans mu. Mu is never measurable. We do not know it. It's not possible to ever, ever know it. No matter how many data points we take, we can never know mu. But at best, what we would like is to find a range at the lower bound and upper bound that spans that mu, that population parameter. So the key is that this is unknown, but we would like to find bounds that at least contain it. What this derivation is about is finding what those bounds are and how to interpret them. So we simply we do the following. Based on what we learned last class, we learned that areas under the histogram are related to probabilities. So here's my Z distribution. The area under this curve is equal to 1. If I find a lower bound and an upper bound that contains 95% of all Z values, I would simply say, Here's my lower bound, minus Cn. So C stands for critical values. What is the critical value on the normal distribution and the upper critical value on the normal distribution so that 95% of all Z values lie within that range from minus Cn to plus Cn? So the lower bound of Cn here, or what we would call minus Cn, what's the lower critical value, and the upper critical value plus Cn. Those values are found so that here's 2.5% of the area, and here is 2.5% of the area. So inside those bounds, being a symmetrical distribution, 95% of all Z values would lie inside those lower and upper bounds. So Cn is found, we can use R, the Q norm function. The Q norm function, recall, says if I know the cumulative area under the distribution, what is the corresponding Z coordinate down here? So Z at 97.5 comes down, or Z at 2.5%. So you can prove that yourself. Q norm of, of uh, 0 0.025 is just the sign of Q norm 0.975. Okay, so prove that to yourself in my The sign is just proof. But essentially you'll get the same value on the z axis. And it corresponds to about this value of, remember we said in last class, 2. 
so there's, there's uh, <coughs> several parameters that you must memorize on the normal distribution data. The values between plus and minus one on the z-axis contain how much of the area? 70%. The values between plus and minus two on my normal distribution contain 95% of the area. So that's why the true value is 1.96. You can just remember the two. That's a good rule. Now I've got that. Let me substitute what z is. z is x bar minus mu, the normalized variable. Z bar as uh, x bar minus mu divided by sigma over root n. So that's simply a substitution of what z is. With a little bit of algebra that you should have remembered from high school, you can work with these inequalities and divide, uh, multiply out by sigma over n, and rearrange this so that at the end you're left with mu in the middle. <coughs> And we've now essentially constructed, so prove, prove the algebra to yourself outside of class. We'll leave it up here on the slides for now. But you can prove to yourself that this construction finds a lower bound and an upper bound for mu. And that lower bound is x bar minus the critical value of about 2. So x bar minus 2 times sigma over root n. This is why I said, well, let's assume sigma for now. I know what sigma is, was the value of 3.5 from the previous slide. Root n, I know. I know how many samples are taken independently. Cn, I get that from software or from the tables that we have printed out. And x bar is the calculated mean from the n data points of sample. So everything on the left hand side here is known. So I can find, find that lower bound. Everything on the right hand side is known. And also, obviously, they're symmetrical. There's x bar minus this term, x bar plus that term. This is the interval, the lower bound and upper bound, that will contain with 95% the population mean. So that mu, the population mean, which we do not know and can never know, but at least we can find intervals that are bounded for us. So by summing all these values, I get that for those polymer data, it's about a range between 17.7 and 22.3. So let's just go look back up at the raw data. If I had to look at those raw data, here's the mean of 20. I've got a spread of about four units. It's saying that whatever, whatever the population is that this data came from, we don't know. This may have come from a chi-square distribution. It might have been even a uniform distribution. However, the true mean of that bale viscosity, the population mean, is going to be some number that lies within a range of 16.7 and 22.3. It seems a little bit abstract for now, just to say that, but actually I hope to convey to you in today's class that that really is a very useful way of talking about variables. For one, if someone gave this information to me, I can instantly back calculate what the sample mean was. Okay. The sample mean is, remember the sample mean was 20 back from back up here. I gave it to you. But if someone just gave you those lower bound and upper bound and did not tell you what the sample mean is, what would it be? Your, what, would, what would it be? <coughs> exactly halfway in between based on this symmetrical construction up here. So we see it's x bar minus the same value, x bar plus the same value. So in other words, it's clear that x bar is the midpoint between those two numbers. If someone, if I was told that that's the 95% confidence, the fact that it's the 95% confidence means I know what the CN value was. I can quickly go look that up in R or on, on a table. Okay, so I, I could figure out CN just based on the fact that they, they would state here, this is the 95% confidence interval. If they also told me that we used 10 samples, is it 10 in this example? Nine samples? If they told me that there was nine samples there, I could go and back help they would that signal value okay. So the statement of the confidence interval gives you an idea of the central location the x bar, but it also gives you an idea of the spread. And it gives you an idea of um, how much, essentially based on that level of confidence, what that width of that range is that contains the true mean. Next question, what happens if I take more samples? What's going to happen to that bound? 
the lower bound and upper bound. If I take more and more samples, I say take 18 laboratory samples. Going to get narrower? The bounds are going to get narrower because n is in the denominator. So more samples I take, I'm going to subtract off a smaller number, I'm going to add a smaller number, so the bounds come in. With diminishing returns, there's a diminishing returns here because the more samples I take, I'm always taking the square root of it. So it's not a linear change in the bounds size. There's going to be diminishing returns. If I take 10 samples and then go to 20, I've doubled the number of samples, but I haven't halved my interval. Okay? So it's not, it's not convenient to take many, many more samples. It doesn't pay after a certain point to take more and more samples. Can you get a confidence interval? You see your boss says to you, look, I'm not happy with that, but can, I, can you get a, I, that's too wide for me, I, I'm not, that's not useful to say that the mean is such a broad in the range. I really need, I really need um, a narrower interval. What else can you do? <coughs> You could give the 70% confidence interval instead. Okay, so you could get a 70% confidence interval. What's going to happen to CN? So if I wanted a 70% confidence interval, right now I've illustrated here the 95% confidence interval. What if I wanted a 70% confidence interval? What's going to happen there? CN moves out. Okay, so 70% interval comes in. CN values become smaller. So I'm going to add on a smaller value. Okay, so I'm saying to you, I can get a narrower bound. I can bring my bound in, but I've got less confidence for you. Okay, so now I'm not 95% confidence. I'm 70, only 70% 70 confidence. So I can always shrink my bounds, but I'm going to be less confident. Or I can spend more money and take more samples. So it's your choice. You can either be less confident or splurge. Okay, so it's statistics always give you this trade-off on what to do. So bring my CN value, in other words, reduce my level of confidence, and I'm going to be get a tighter bound. Can you get a bound 100% confidence interval? So if you was in, you need to be 100% confident about that bound. Can you be 100% confident? No. Andrew? Are you allowed to say it's plus or minus infinity? Plus or minus infinity. Then you're always going to be 100% confident. <laughs> Absolutely right. So if you wanted 100% confidence, n has to go up to infinity. Uh, sorry, it has to go down to zero. And then you can get a bound. Sorry, no. We want to be a hundred. We want a bound. Sorry, ignore what I said. If you want to be hundred percent confident, the only way to be hundred percent confident is to essentially have infinite bounds. So, if you are hundred percent confident, CN goes to up, up here to infinity, essentially, and up to plus infinity. So, C it we're adding and subtracting here, essentially a large, large value. So that's the only way you can be have 100% confidence, is to have infinite So it's, it's a useless bound. To be 100% confidence is useless. Okay, so the very next question you must be asking is saying, Kevin, well, we don't know sigma. Why the hell would you not know mu, but you know sigma? Okay, we can never have that case, where I know my, my population mean, but I, I don't know my population mean, I'm finding a bound for it. But how come you know your population variance? That, that doesn't make sense, right? So, and in fact, that's true. Whenever someone says to you, you need to know sigma in order to use my statistical tool that will do great things for you, you say, that's rubbish, right? Um, you can't ever know sigma, you can't ever know mu. So we need to construct a bound that does not require this excessive <coughs> knowledge of sigma, which we will never have. So what we say instead is let me substitute sigma and replace it by my sample standard deviation. So my population sigma up here now 
reduce that down and replace it with S, my sample standard deviation. So I know what that is. I go back to my raw data up here. S is 3.81. Notice the sample standard deviation is 3.5. So it's pretty close, but it's not, it's not my population value. So I sub in 3.8 instead of 3.5. One gotcha. Z doesn't follow the normal distribution angle. Okay, so if I know sigma, Z comes from the normal distribution. If I don't know sigma, Z does not come from the normal distribution. So we have to make one other assumption. Unfortunately, because the knowledge of sigma is so strong and powerful, if we want to relax that assumption, there's a price to pay. And the price to pay is we now sub in S instead of U, but the price we have to pay is that the X values come from a normal distribution. So previously I said my X values come from any distribution as long as there's finite variance. So please add this to your slides. I've updated this. Um, it's in the, in the printed text of the course notes, but it's not in the slides. This isn't a new assumption you have to make. Well, not a new assumption, it's an important assumption you have to make that your data that you sample Xi, firstly they're independent, that assumption still is required. That assumption does not go away. We still require independence, but now we require as well that these Xi values come from the normal distribution. How are you going to verify that? We, we can't just go around our whole life in engineering and do this, assume this, assume that, assume this, assume that, but we never actually check it. This class, every time you make an assumption, I guarantee I'm also going to give you a way how to check it. How do you check that your x i from the normal distribution? Right? You could from last class. Okay, so I've, I've taught this concept earlier so that we can use it here now. First thing you do, make sure my data are independent. That requires a little bit of thought. You've, most of you had in the weekly test the question on are these data independent or not, and I gave you a few examples. You had to check, check some answers. So not all of you got that question in the weekly test, but most of you should have. You have to think very carefully through the situation when your data are independent or not. So if XI are independent, and secondly, they come from a normal distribution, I can now sub in, instead of sigma, I can put in my S, and now Z is not normally distributed anymore, Z comes from the T distribution. So X bar minus mu divided by S over root N now comes from the T distribution. If I know sigma, it's X bar minus mu divided by sigma over root N, that comes from the normal distribution. But if I don't know sigma, which is for every case you will deal with in practice, we have to resort to the second thing over here. And you have to assume that your xi are normal distribution. You don't have to just assume it, you have to check it. So, we've learned about the normal distribution. The normal distribution has two parameters, mu and the variance. The t distribution is nice. It has one parameter, <coughs> mu. Mu, or this little v, we call it a v mu. It refers to the degrees of freedom. What are the degrees of freedom? Well, the degrees of freedom for a T distribution are, are uh, illustrated up here. So here's our conceptual approach now. We take data now from the normal distribution. This is my assumption. My data come from the normal distribution with a population mean and a population variance. Normal distribution, first assumption. Second assumption, take independent samples. I calculate the mean X bar. That X bar comes from the T distribution. T distribution has one parameter, new. Mu is called the degrees of freedom. I have lost a degree of freedom by calculating this mean. I had n data points originally. Calculating the average of them consumes a degree of freedom. It's reduced my degrees of freedom by one, so my degrees of freedom are n. The number of data points I've taken, the sample of minus one. So the t distribution in R, if you wanted to calculate it, you use the qt function and the um, pt function. So depending on whether you want to go forwards or backwards, you could use QT and PT. And they take one input, the degrees of freedom, N minus one. And so the, 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 the Q norm and the P norm function in R, that requires two variables that you have to give. You have to give it the mean and the standard deviation. 
the T distribution only has one parameter for degrees of freedom. Let's understand what the T distribution looks like. For engineering purposes, it almost looks identical to the normal distribution. Why am I making such a big deal of it? Right, so I superimpose the normal distribution as the darker line, the T distribution as the thin line. Very, very little difference between those two distributions. Both centered at zero. But the T distribution seems to come out, comes down a little bit, so it's not doesn't quite reach the same level of probability that the normal distribution has. It's got slightly broader tails. So it comes up above the normal distribution here to make up for the area that it's lost over there. So slightly broader tails, narrower center. The T distribution is indistinguishable from the normal distribution after about eight or nine or ten. So I've shown it up here for five to, to show you if there's a difference. <coughs> Sorry, I've shown it here for eight. Okay? A very little difference already noticeable. You'll see far more of a difference if you superimpose it for four, four degrees of freedom, five degrees of freedom. But really after eight, nine, or ten, numerically, very little difference. But we do make it this 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 distinguish. This is, uh, I do distinguish the difference between the normal and the T distribution because theoretically we have to be sound. We can't just disobey statistical laws and say, well, look, the, the two are indistinguishable, might as well just use the normal distribution. Let's still be theoretically sound and use the T distribution where appropriate. But recognizing, I strongly re recommend you do this, you prove to yourself that if you've got a very large sample size, 15 data points, really you can't see too much of a difference. That lower bound and upper bound we calculate will not be very different. So let's take a look at let's take a look at that. What is the construction now for the case when I don't know the, the sample variance? So we still calculate Z in the usual way, X bar minus mu divided by S over root N. What distribution does this come from? We've just learned it comes from the T distribution. Specifically, the T distribution with eight degrees of freedom. I have nine data points, used one up to calculate the mean, I've lost the degree of freedom there. Check that my XI raw data follow a normal distribution. Very easy to do. You can plot, give it a vector of the nine original data points, you use the car library, construct beautiful confidence limits for you, and you'll, you can quickly tell whether these data come from a normal distribution or not. Checkpoint. Do they come from a normal distribution? If yes, proceed. If no, you stop. There's nothing else that you can do. You can't find lower and upper bounds. The, the rule is we must have those raw data coming from the normal distribution. <coughs> Assuming that they do, what would those lower and upper bounds be? Well, now we say Z comes from the T distribution. Previously, Z came from the normal distribution. <coughs> so now, since Z comes from the T distribution, so I'm not going to change this curve because I've just shown you that for many purposes that curve looks very similar to the, t, to the normal distribution. The only difference that changes is the bounds which we use at the lower and upper end are minus CT and plus CT. So the critical values for the T distribution that span 95% of the area. So in R, we say QT of 0 0.025, that gets you the minus CT value, and QT of 0 0.975 gets you the CT plus CT value. Okay, so we can find that lower and upper bound using that, and you would also have to specify the degrees of freedom. Okay, so in this case I get 2.31, plus or minus 2.31. Bigger than I had before. It says that you, your range is broader, not, not quite as narrow as it was before. Substitute that value in, unpack this confidence interval, and get a lower bound and upper bound. So it's now x bar minus ct times s over root n, not sigma over root n. So two things have changed here. I'm using s instead of sigma, and I'm using ct instead of cn. And if I sub in those, those different numbers, 
I can show these two in intervals. One where I know sigma, and the second one where sigma is being replaced by s. The second interval is broader, and it must be, and it will be in every instance in general. The reason is, <coughs> sigma is broad, uh, sorry, the range is broader, the lower bound and upper bound is broader, we have greater uncertainty. I do not know my sigma. The fact that I'm replacing sigma with an, a, a, an estimated variable, standard deviation s. Now I've got two sources of error here. Firstly, I'm calculating x bar from the sample, and I'm calculating uh, sorry, x bar from the sample, and I'm calculating s as well from the sample of data. So I'm using two computed values derived from my raw data in here. My interval is broader. So conceptually, we expect a broader interval. We're saying, I really can't estimate quite as well for you what the true population bound is going to be. Okay, so here's an example, uh, another example that you can work through. Your customer is evaluating the product and they want to know a confidence interval for the level of impurities in the product. And you say to them, well, the confidence interval is between 429 and 673 parts per million at 95%. This is a very compact representation of, of that. It's quite the same as saying the sample mean using the last amount of data is 532. That 532 is just the midpoint of those two data points. Okay, so I can infer what my sample mean is. I can also infer what my sample standard deviation is by back calculating, as long as I know what n was, the number, here they said we used the last year of data. Well, if I ask, in addition to your 95% confidence, how many data points did you use to get that, that bound? Well, n was such and such. If I know what n is, I can back calculate what the sample standard deviation is. Okay. And this instantly gets me a level of, of spread. If I go to one supplier and I get that confidence interval from them, and I go to another supplier and they give me a confidence interval that's narrower, which supplier do you pick? The narrower one. The supplier that's able to provide you a narrower interval is the supplier that's able to provide you a product with consistency. Okay, but wider the interval, the more variance there is in their process. So look at the look at this lower bound and upper bound. The lower bound and upper bound are proportional to the variance of the standard deviation. So a process that's very inconsistent and producing product all over the map has a high S. It's going to have larger bounds. So very, very intuitively we can see here that narrow bounds are more desirable. Okay. A company that's able to produce product with narrow bounds with you on the confidence interval is a better company to work with. They've got lower variability. From the class a few classes back, we stress the idea of variability as being a, a damaging to our reputation, it's damaging to our cost, it's damaging to our profitability. So being able to get narrower confidence bounds implies that we're able to produce more systematic and consistent product. So we like processes that have narrower confidence intervals. Okay, so I would argue that a confidence interval conveys all of this information out here very compactly. We're used to talking about this is my mean in sample data. Sometimes we don't even give the standard deviation. But a confidence interval, you cannot hide that. Okay, someone telling you, oh, the average, the average impurity in my process is 500. 30. You can't stop there. You've got to push them for more. No, that's not good enough. I don't want to just know your average. I want to know how consistent are you? What's your spread? <coughs> if they give you the confidence interval, they can't hide that information from you. You instantly see the spread and you get the average from those two numbers right away. So confidence intervals, we like. So <coughs> here you can show um, that the bounds are going uh, how to calculate the bounds and you can also show based on this comparison here uh, why the t distribution and the normal distribution are uh, going to give you different bounds. So I encourage 600 level students that you prove to yourself that the lower bounds and upper bounds are always going to be wider for the case where you don't know sigma. So 
So let's just summarize here quickly. The term between the confidence interval. The confidence interval never implies that x bar <coughs> is within the range. Okay, this is important. People always get this point confused. The confidence interval has got nothing to do with x bar. x bar guaranteed is always going to be in the center point of your confidence interval, just mathematically, by definition. So x bar is not at all related to, uh, <coughs> ci is not at all related to x bar. So it's meaningless to talk about my average is within the confidence interval. Of course it is. That's brain game, because by the definition it is. It's incorrect to say my average viscosity lies within the range of 17.1 to 22.9 with 95% probability. Okay, your sample data, again, your confidence interval is not related to your average, that your sample average. The confidence interval is only about mu. That's all it's about, is mu. The confidence interval does imply that mu is expected to lie within the interval. With the <coughs> Confidence interval is all about the range of possible values for mu, not for x bar. It's simply telling you between this lower bound and upper bound is where you expect to find the true mean mu. Okay, now here's the part that's, that's important. If I go repeat this experiment, and I go take another nine data points, for example, another set of n data points, I'm going to get a different <coughs> lower bound and a different upper bound. And I repeat the experiment, and I'm going to get another lower bound and upper bound. So here's experiment one. I'm going to get lower bound one and lower bound two. Then I go run another experiment, collect n data points. I'm going to get a lower bound and an upper bound. And I repeat a third experiment, a lower bound three and an upper bound three. And I can go do this many times. And let's say I have enough time and resources on my hands, or I have a TA, and they do lower bound 20 and upper bound 20. Or a grad student. I've done two experiments. Every time these are the 95% confidence intervals. 19 out of 20 of these bounds will contain the true value of mu. One out of those 20 you will not be inside the bound. That's what 95% confidence says. Okay? That's why it's 95% confidence. 19 times out of 20, that bound will contain mu. One out of the 20 times, your bounds are going to be here, and mu is going to be out of it. So, if this is now semantics. For people who do English is not your first language, you're going to look at these next two sentences and say to me they're identical to each other. They're not. So let's take a look at it carefully. The confidence interval is the probability that the confidence interval range contains the true mu. It's not the probability that the true mu is within the range. So the first one says the range contains the mu. The second one says the mu is within the range. Okay. If confidence interval is not probability that mu is within the range. The reason is, mu is a fixed number. There is no probability related with it. Mu is absolutely 100% known. It doesn't shift, it doesn't change, there's no probability. So it's not the probability that the true mu is in the range. It is the probability that the range contains the mu, and that's all that confidence interval is. <coughs> So you must understand that distinction. CI is not about X bar, the CI <coughs> is only about mu. About the population. Okay, so if the confidence level is 95%, 5% of the time that interval will not contain the true mu. <coughs> okay, this was we spoke about this earlier. We looked at uh, changing the confidence interval. Sarah has mentioned this this by 70% confidence. So I would like you to prove to yourself that you can go to higher and higher confidence levels, that down will get broader and broader and broader. If I increase the value of n, my bounds become tighter, but there's diminishing returns. Okay, so summarize here with these two slides, the variance is known. We have this very artificial case which we never, sure, yes. If 
what, what's the value then in doing that many experiments if we don't ever do, a, do sort of an aggregate representation of the lower and upper bound? If we just have 20 different upper and lower bounds, what's okay. the advantage? The, the reality is, in fact, we would never do this. This is too costly. We would only ever have money if we measure any data points. But we're saying, with those n data points, there's a chance, a remote chance, one time out of 20, that this bound that I'm going to present to you as my, my boss or as my customer or whoever is going to consume this, this data or this information, that you're going to be wrong. You have to take your chances. If someone says, well, I don't like your 95% probability, you say, okay, I can give you a 99% probability, but those bounds are going to be broader. Or give me more money, and I can go take more data, and I can go get you a better and better estimate. So it's giving you those trade-offs. So and one of the questions you will have on the next assignment is to say, how many data points do I need to take in order to get to a certain level of confidence? So we can also run it backwards. OK, so here's the artificial case where we don't, where we do know the variance never exists. More realistically, we make the assumption that my data are from a normal distribution and that independent of each other. If that's met, both those conditions are met. <coughs> Red is now T distributed with the new degrees of freedom, or n minus one degrees of freedom. I can construct the bound using plus and minus CT, and I use my estimated S. You'll see confidence intervals in a few other cases. Um, just to talk about it essentially before uh, to wrap up here, there's a population. Uh, confidence intervals, I should say, for the population variance. Sometimes we want to compare the variance um, or find bounds that contain the variance. We found bounds now that are for, for mu, but we can easily construct bounds that contain an estimate of the variance. Clearly, sigma is a positive quantity. These bounds should also be positive quantities. So we're finding lower and upper bounds within which we estimate our variance to lie. Ones that you've definitely seen before, if you've pay, uh, read any newspaper or listened to news reports, you'll hear about politicians and their polls. And for example, let's say political party XYZ has 35% of the vote, with a margin of 3% error, and it's accurate 19 times out of 20. So you've heard that sort of terminology before. 19 times out of 20, that's a confidence interval. Essentially, the political polls have done a phone phoned a number of people, the sample size of people, and some proportion, so this is a proportion now, some proportion of the population has said, I'm going to vote for party XYZ. 35% of the, the people that you phoned up said that. If I phone a different thousand people, I'm going to get a different number. I'm going to phone another thousand people, I'm going to get 32%. If I phone another thousand people, I'm going to get 37%. So every time I phone, my, my data, and I'm going to take independent samples, I'm going to get a different number here. What's the level of error? What's the level of spread? A margin of 3%. How accurate are you? 95%. What's my level of confidence? So you'll see these statements regularly in the media. That's all it is. It's a, it's a, pop, a confidence interval, not for you. We, we won't look at these confidence intervals. This is a, a confidence interval for, its, for the proportion. How many people out of the sample that you've found, which fraction of them have the preference for A or B or C? Okay, so you can also do the same for food products. I have produced pizzas with so many pepperoni slices, how many have, have the required specifications? Um, so you see this sometimes in, in manufacturing. Okay, so we'll continue our next class.